What's going on, everyone? Hope you're having a great day. In this episode, we have the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Elliot Hulse. And we get into a really great conversation. Elliot, his content has heavily revolved around masculinity over the past few years. However, he has been on YouTube and he has been creating really quality content for several years now. That's initially how I actually came across Elliot, was when I was on a weight loss journey. And I briefly touch on that in our conversation. If you would like to check out more of Elliot's work, I include links and resources in the description below because this is a type of individual I could speak to for hours and hours on end. So I wanted to keep it relatively short, but give you the resources you need in order to delve down deeper into what Elliot's involved with or explore more of what we're talking about in this episode. So I encourage you to have a look at the links in the description and I will be overlaying some content on top of the episode. Without further ado, I leave you myself and Elliot Hulse in conversation. And this is We The Ether Podcast. I thank you for watching in advance. Hit it with a thumbs up if you found it informative, entertaining, add it to your favorites, share it with a friend, comment down below, and I'll catch you again on that next one. See you soon. Mr. Elliot Hulse, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. How's the weather? Uh, about 85 degrees here. Okay, and sunny as hell, I imagine, right? Yep, getting hotter and hotter. Yeah, yeah. I'm up in, uh, so I'm in Toronto, Canada, and it's just cold, cloudy, rainy. It's like we've gone from winter, skipped spring entirely. I feel like we're in a super hot summer. And then it's going to go back to fall. So I feel a little bit like I'm getting gypped right now. And I almost yep. want to take a, a trip down to Florida. <laughs> I know a bunch of people down there, even in Cali. And just yep. the amount of warmth and sunshine you guys get. Like yesterday especially, I was feeling super lethargic. I was like, this is yep. ridiculous. I'm going to pick up and move soon. Mm -hmm. Yep. You get so anyway, that aside, uh, do you mind just to kick things off, introducing yourself, uh, what it is you're involved with, for anyone that's not familiar, I'm sure, because I'll be putting this on YouTube, people will be familiar there. Uh, but anyone else that's not in that fitness health type of space, they may not be totally aware of what you're involved with. So if you could just kick things off and uh, introduce yourself. I am a strong man. I'm a strength coach, the CEO of Strength Camp, and I make men strong again. Very cool. And you had started, I noticed you actually posted on your Instagram today, but you had started a non-job campaign going back several years now. Do you mind just elaborating a little bit on what that exactly entails, what that, what that means exactly? Well, I'm kind of a pioneer online. Uh, I started a YouTube channel in 2007. I made my first website in like 2004. And so uh, as an entrepreneur, as a trainer, I learned very quickly how to use the internet in order to uh, build my business. And as I started gaining in popularity, I wanted to help my fans do the same thing. And so I consolidated all my experience and knowledge into a video course, or actually it started out with just a movement. I started making YouTube videos in 2012, teaching people for free how to build an online business around the thing that they love. You know, my, my phrase back then was, uh, I don't remember, it's something pretty cliche now, but when I was saying it was brand new, it was like, you know, earn a living doing what you love, which basically was the idea. Now everybody's a coach that teaches that but I was one of the first. And so when you talk about non-jobs, it's kind of a throwback, you know, and I'm promoting it right now on my Instagram channel, but I, I know that I laid that spark down, you know, going on six years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember even, I, I subscribed to your channel back then, actually. You know what, I, I subscribed around the time when you were doing, you increase your upload frequency. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden you went, you know what, I'm going hard on, on the tubes and you decided you're just going to start pumping out content. I think you were doing multiple recordings a day and you're really pushing this non-job campaign. I think I even uh, went to the Facebook fan page because it was, it was booming at the time. I'm not sure. I, I assume you still have that page and it's still very active with people, but it seems like a lot of people were getting, getting involved, getting inspired by what you were promoting and what you're trying to basically just guide people in a direction of you don't have to necessarily be in this fixed state of being this only state of being that you created for yourself. Like there's other ways to live, you know, other ways yeah. to you're kind of just introducing people to this, this concept. So I, I really love the non-job campaign, which you started. And mm -hmm. um, that's, that's why I just really wanted to touch on it really quickly. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm glad that you're bringing it back because it's one of those things that I think it should be renewed, even though people do preach it now constantly mm -hmm. online. I feel like as one of the pioneers of this whole concept, I feel like it should be, continuously reinforced because like yeah. it's something like 
a good majority of people do not operate this way. I mean, even from my experience, the, the bulk of my friends, they're all at work right now. They're in their cubicles, you know, like it's, it's pretty crazy. And a lot of them, I try to even broach the idea that they could do something outside of that. And it's just it, the amount of fear that arises within them is, uh, is outstanding. So it's like, we need people like yourself, uh, and, and, and again, the pioneers in that space to really reinforce that, that you can achieve whatever you want really in life. You can, you can stop right there and, and change course and make it, make a huge shift for yourself. So mm -hmm. thank you for, for supporting everyone and doing that. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to touch on intermittent fasting because I know it's something you started really getting heavily involved with recently and autophagy especially. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we have a mutual acquaintance, uh, Simland. And I think yeah. he's done some books recently. He was actually on this podcast, mm -hmm. I think last year. And uh, did you have him on yours recently? No, not yet. Okay. Okay. Maybe it was like an Instagram discussion I saw between you two. Ah, uh, yeah, we've done that. Okay, cool. All right. So I wanted to get the gist of what the greatest benefit you've experienced so far from doing intermittent fasting and from autophagy in general. So from basically just not eating. And I know you've, you've even started to experiment with dry fasting or you're considering doing so is that right so my first experience with fasting was in 2002 and it was a religious fast i was introduced to the baha'i faith and within weeks of me meeting the community uh they were doing a they were doing a fast a 19-day fast and so they fast it's a dry fast from sun up to sundown that means no food no water from sunrise to sunset and that was my first you know prior to that i played college football, high school football. I was a lifter. I ate six meals a day and probably never missed a meal in my life. And then when I went these 19 days doing uh, intermittent dry fasting, not only did my body composition change and my physiology change, but my mind changed. And back then we didn't have the science that we have now that's validating a lot of what many of our masters over the course of millennia understood. All great leaders and teachers and manifestations of God have suggested to mankind that we should fast and so back then uh the i was just astonished by the metaphysical gains that were associated with it and and, and in my mind and what many of our ancestors took for granted uh and called the the blessings of god descending upon you through the through following the law of fasting and that's the way i felt about it I, my mind got sharper my energy went up i was I felt different. I thought differently. I behaved. My whole character changed. And so that was my first introduction to it. So what, what, what diet or what were you eating prior to really getting involved in that? Because I know you're, you're very aware of your body and you have been over the past several years. And the fact that you have, or, you know, every human being has these gut microbiome that it's, it's in essence a second brain and it can start to guide people's decision-making process in a certain way. So what were you eating prior to getting into fasting? Was it, was it something that, like, what triggered that initial desire to, to make that shift and to really experiment with, with cleaning everything out? And I don't like the word cleanse, but to cleanse yourself in that way. Well, I wasn't. That's not what my thought was. My thought was this was a, uh, this was a law from God, and it was a part of the religion, and so I did it. I wasn't thinking about autophagy. In fact, there was no such thing back then. That was like a 2016 discovery. <laughs> there was no uh, autophagy. We didn't, nobody was talking about ketosis back then. Yeah, yeah. Nobody was talking about fasting at all back then except for crazy religious nuts. Yeah, yeah. Right. I actually have, uh, uh, I've won a fasting video on YouTube and, and that, like back then I, I was making it because I saw the Hodge twins talking about it. And um, I think it's almost at a million views, but uh, it, it's something, again, it wasn't really being discussed. And I'm surprised because how popular it is now. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's blown up, so to speak. And I, I don't know if it's just because so many people are talking about it, but maybe it is just that religious spiritual connection that's really driving the success of, of intermittent fasting and autophagy now because, because of kind of what I alluded to a second ago with the, the fact that your, your gut microbiome is, is causing such disruption in a lot of people's lives. And, and I say that from personal experience. If I, if I go off the rails and have a bunch of garbage food for the next few weeks, it's almost like I feel like I'm in a hazy dream going around. It's like I'm not even there. It's like I'm just operating on just defaults like what I've learned it's 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 like no new inspiration or intuitions are coming in they're not flowing through there's like something blocking it so mm -hmm. uh, I wonder yeah. if it's just that that exact thing that you, you 
I, I suppose, is it fair to say that you did it because of spiritual, a spiritual type of practice or? That was my introduction to it. Yeah. yeah, that's how I, that's how and when I began fasting. And I fasted for, from 2002 through 2006 when I became a professional strawman or I started strawman and then I stopped fasting because I thought it was an antithesis to my muscle building and strength building. And so I was like, man, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do this fast any longer. And it was, it was done once a year. And I even had the fear that if I did 19 days of fasting once a year, I'd lose all these gains. Yeah. And then it wasn't very long, 2000, four years later, two th around 2010, uh, I was introduced to Brad Pilon and his book, Eat, Stop, Eat. And that was the very first time I had ever seen any scientific research done on fasting and why it should be implemented as a fitness and health uh uh regimen it was I, i've never i've never heard of this you know for me it was it was a religious thing completely then when he started talking about growth hormone and and muscle sparing and body recomposition and what it does for your health i was awoken to the fact that uh that this is something that we can do for, for our bodies as well for our as an athlete, you know, as a fitness enthusiast. And so I introduced it I, again, you know, I know I'm kind of a, I'm a spark. I realized that. And I'm like usually one of the first people at most things and I bring things to the world. And, and when I brought eat, the idea of eat, stop, eat, which was all it was, was one day a week, 24 hour fast. And I put it in my lean hybrid muscle program, which I released in like 2009 to the muscle building and, and strength uh, niche. Everybody was shitting themselves. They're like, there, there's no way, Elliot. We can't not eat a day. I think it was on a Wednesday, I suggested. Everybody fast on a Wednesday. And at first, everybody was freaking out. But then the results started coming in. And people were, were loving the results of the program, but also the result of what was happening because they were fasting once a week. And so uh, from there... I began reintroducing intermittent fasting into my life rather than the prolonged fast for the religious fast, which I still do. And I still recommend uh, a few times a year now uh, was this building it into your lifestyle as a fasting focused lifestyle. So uh, in 2013 through 2015, when my YouTube videos were at its at their most uh, popular, I was fasting twice a week. I was going every Monday and every Friday. And that was when I was at my leanest and I was at my most energetic and I was looking my best. So uh, it's, it's great to see now that that spark has turned into a raging fire worldwide where people are re-recognizing the power of non-consumption, non-doing, getting out of the way and allowing the body to heal. Mm -hmm. I love that, non-doing, perfect. And I know now you're getting involved a little bit into veganism, right? is, is that correct? No. Okay, I saw. <laughs> you know, I saw uh, you. I like the idea of veganism. Oh, I really do. I, I saw you both oh, with Mike, Mike Rashid, and you were asking him about because he's jacked and swollen. You know, he's like, I don't think veganism got him there per se, <laughs> but I know he's maintaining in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you're not experimenting with the, the notion of switching over to a vegan type of diet. No, I've done vegan diets. Okay. Uh, I'm not against it. It do, I, I don't like it for me, um, but I see the value of it. Uh, I'm an extremist, and I'm even, ex I'm even an extremist in my ideologies, meaning I'm willing to entertain the most extreme ideas. In fact, I'm only interested by the most extreme ideas. So I became a big fan of Arnold Errett for a while, and I was studying all his work, and he's a fruitarian. And I, w I even, when I was on this path doing a 10-day fast earlier this year, I became really intrigued with this idea of, of breathitarianism, <laughs> where, it not, I mean, it takes it one step further. Fruitarianism is like the far end of the spectrum with regard to uh, veganism. I mean, there's veganism and then there's, no, we're just eating fruit. And then you take it even further left, you have breathitarians. And I find these people very fascinating. I, I've read a lot of books and I've seen a lot of people on YouTube where uh, they basically just don't eat and they, they live on prama, prana. <laughs> they call it prana, pranic nourishment. So, I mean, that's an extreme idea. You want to go one end of the spectrum really far. I was willing to explore that and play with it a little bit. And that's what I was doing when I did a 10-day fast. After I got out of my 10-day fast, and this was just April, 
two months ago, uh, I, I ate vegan for about three weeks. And, uh, and I found that it, and I've done that before. I found that it's great for cleansing. It's great for resetting. It's great for, uh, it's great for a change of pace, but just as a lifestyle for me as a strength athlete and a lifter, uh, and someone who, who struggled for quite a few years with autoimmune inflammation, uh, I started getting fat and itchy. <laughs> so it just, it, my insulin was way too high because I was eating way too many fruits and grains. And, you know, if you're going to get your, your, your calories as a vegan, it's going to be a lot of starch. It's going to be a lot of, you know, plant-based. What are you going to get with plants? You know, you're going to get a lot of carbohydrates. That may be okay for some people, but for me, I get puffy right away. I start getting really fat. And then also because of, because of the high amounts of starch and sugar and, you know, all these things, I started getting inflammation again. I started getting rashes and dandruff and shit. So, you know, it only took about two weeks for that to come back. And I was like, all right. And then just because I'm in this realm of exploration and, and being extreme, I went and started playing around the carnivore diet. So I did an interview with uh, Paul Saladino. And uh, same thing, you know, I, I was intrigued by the idea. I gave it a go for a couple of weeks. Uh, but then again, as a strength athlete, and as a lifter, uh, I wasn't getting the glycogen that I needed in my tissue. My, my, uh, my intensity in the gym was going down. So uh, within one quarter of a year, <laughs> but I do this all the time. I ping pong back and forth. Uh, I went, I was breathitarian vegan to carnivore. And where I'm at right now, what I've discovered and what I've really solidified in my consciousness and, and, and take home from all this is that it really doesn't matter what side of the spectrum are you are on if you're not fasting fasting is the underlying fasting is the key Fa fasting is the foundation you can take a vegan who's very sick and give him time restricted eating and he'll begin to rejuvenate you could take a, a carnivore and the same or somebody on the other end of the spectrum because you know you're stimulating mTOR and they are, there's constant protein synthesis and like eating on this end of the spectrum makes you old fast too it controls insulin. This one cleanses the digestive tract. This one cleanses the hormones. But if neither of them are fasting, they're not finding that foundation from which all good health uh, moves forward. I don't care what part of the planet your ancestors are from, be they from in an equatorial place where they're eating mostly plants or from you know, Scandinavia or, uh, or you know, Eskimo and they're eating mostly meat, both of them probably didn't have the glutton of continuous consumption of food like we have in our culture today. So the key is to stop eating. Mm, yeah, that must be it. Like it's just the amount of sheer volume of food now. Is, is like, so I guess the type of diet, it's, it's not so much irrelevant, but I guess it would vary individual to individual. But as long as there's that baseline of intermittent fasting, time restricted eating, then it's fair to say that that person is going to see whatever gains it may be, weight loss or muscle, even muscle development in that case. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, I believe that. Very cool. Yeah, I'm, actually, I'm personally on a, on a journey right now of, I mean, I, I put on a bunch of weight uh, several years back, did intermittent fasting, cut it all down. Now I'm personally trying to gain weight. I'm trying to work my way up to, I weigh 205 today, trying to get up to 220. Nice. Um, and I find it tricky with intermittent fasting mm -hmm. because it's like uh, I, I just cut weight the next day. Uh, I mean, I wake up and I see, oh, I'm down two pounds. Like I could stuff my face. And it's almost to the point I stuff my face and I just start to feel sick from eating. So uh, I'm trying to find a balance of how to gain lean muscle um, while doing intermittent fasting. And uh, it's, it's funny a longer, it's, slower process for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm finding that myself. Like I'm, I've sort of spent out two years to, uh, to achieve this 220 pound goal. There's 15 pounds in two years. I think I'm being reasonable with myself or realistic anyways, but um, yeah. What are, what are your personal goals right now? Because I know you've cut down a lot of weight recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, so like, my goal was to become a skeleton. I wanted, <laughs> I, I wanted to strip everything away. You know, people were talking about, I was doing everything that you can do to lose muscle when I was fasting during my fasting season. I wanted to, I wanted to get down to uh, bare bones the best I could. And I wanted to do it by my birthday. So, you know, I typically walk around to 215 mm. and I got down to 168. And, wow. uh, and, and now, uh, I was re-inspired to get back into strongman competition. 
And so uh, over the course of the next few weeks, I'll be, I, even if I put on a little bit of fat, I don't mind. Uh, I want to get up to around 205, 210. And then I'm going to do a 14 day fast right at the end of June. Uh, and so I want to be a little bit heavier so that I won't go, I won't lose too much weight. And that way I can build it back up and re get ready for my contest prep in, mm -hmm. uh, in August. And what inspired you to get back into heavy lifting, strong man, after, after taking that break that you've done over the past few years? It's who I am. Hmm. It's my nature. I've always been this way. I, I, I was six years old and I was strong and I wanted to lift. I remember my dad had like these sand filled rubber plastic weights in the basement and my uncle used to train down there and I'd take the weights and I'd want to do stuff with them. And uh, I played college football, high school football. I was a professional strong man. Uh, it's, I need, I wanted a break from it and I took a little, I took a little break. I took about a three or four year break. Uh, but I'm ready. I'm ready to be me again. Mm -hmm. And what, like, is it that you feel you have an overwhelming amount of, um, of energy? I, I don't know how else to put it, but energy that you feel that like strong men and, and weightlifting and strength is, is an outlet for that. Well, it's also a gift. I'm naturally strong. And I think one of the worst things that we could do is to go through our life not maximizing our, the gifts that were given to us. God made me strong. When people think of Elliot Hulse, they think of strength, strength camp, strong man, deadlifting. I am synonymous with strength. And although I took a detour because, you know, I had other aspects of my consciousness that I wanted to experience and explore, uh, the circle always comes, it always comes full circle to I'm a strong man. <laughs> and I, and I, I make men strong. That's what I do. I'm a strength coach. So it's just, it's not even like something I have to do. It's not even a doing it's, my, it's, it's, it's who I'm being. It's who I am. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Yeah. That's a great way of thinking of it. I, I, I think very similarly myself, I, I feel that I'm quite strong and I do deadlifting and squatting. I've done powerlifting competitions and um, this is only over the past few years. Like prior to that, I was, you know, when I was, I put on weight because I was doing that, that nine to five type of, um, it was still a non-job. I've always had my own businesses, but it was still like a nine to five and I'd go out drinking every night of the week and I've just put on tons of weight. So mm. it was like a full transformation for me to lose the weight, start weightlifting, start powerlifting. That's honestly, that's how I found your channel actually to begin with. So it's, it's right. funny you say you make men stronger. That was part of the process for me. It was, uh, you're one of my go-to resources at the time for, okay, let me flip on Elliot's video for the day. And see mm -hmm. what he's going on about. Um, actually, I loved how you would get so philosophical with some of your, your uh, addressing some people's questions. Um, mm -hmm. So getting into getting a little bit away from the lifting side of things, uh, you have a you have grounding camp, and I'd like if you could just elaborate a little bit on that. I know even recently I saw an uh, Instagram clip that you were looking for locations in North America to host grounding camp, and you were saying it's up to 200 people that attend sometimes or that like mm -hmm. 200 men. Yes. Okay. So what exactly is what's going down at these grounding camps? I know you're, you're heavily inspired by Osho and have you seen his, his documentary on Netflix? Yes. Oh, it's a crazy documentary. Okay. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so what exactly is going down at these grounding camps? So I make men strong again, but I do that through strength camp and through grounding camp because there are, other aspects to what make us strong than just the physical body. So strength camp is where I mentor to men's souls and grounding camp has evolved into uh, my attempt to bring back the ancient practice of men's initiation and rites of passage. And so with grounding camp, we honor the, the archetype of initiation, which has uh, a few elements throughout all cultures and all times, these elements uh, run, run concurrent with it. And one of them is a movement away from the mother, the world of the mother, mama's boy, to the world of the father, atonement with the father, the father above and the men in the, in, the, men in the tribe, the men in the, uh, the community. And so that's a part of what happens with grounding camp. You know, we, we, we remove ourselves from society. And that's why I look for these retreat locations and very, uh, rural backwoods away from civilization places uh, and it's all men and our ancestors understood that it was important for men to separate themselves from the world of the matrix the mother material uh, and the mothers knew that also too 
And so when they recognized that a boy was coming into his own, they would remove him and they would off in, in the same process of movement away from the mother, movement towards an atonement with the father. But there would be a, a, a series of elements. There's a series of activities that once again were always there. And so there was always a form of austerity. So a breakdown or humility, a breakdown of the ego. And so there would typically be fasting and there would typically be physical challenge. And uh, it's through the fasting and the physical challenge that one's confronted with their own inner beta, their own inner mama, mama's boy. And, uh, and the, the older men are there to see him through, see him through this challenge and introduce him into the world of masculinity, the world of pattern, the world of paternity, father, where we get the word father from. And so what that meant was that once he was broken down, once he went through the austerity, once he went through the challenge, uh, he was now a clean slate and could be imprinted with the spirit of the father. And this is where religion came from. This is where meaning came from. This is where purpose in life came from. It, the word religion even means re-league, to reunite, to bring together. And so when a young man is broken down and then, re, and then atones with the world of the father, the world of spirit, he becomes uh, one with the, the ancestors, the fathers of old, so that he's no, he knows that he's never alone. So many of us feel alone today. Uh, but like if you remember in The Lion King when Simba was lost in the forest and the old uh, initiator Rafiki brings him up to the mountain and he points to the sky. This is what men always did. They always pointed to the sky and they say, remember your father, even though his father was dead, he said, remember your father and your grandfather and your father's father and their great, great grandfathers. And I keep saying this word father, but I want you to also consider it uh, synonymous with the word pattern. And pattern is, is very intangible. P pattern is like a blueprint. I say that we're the pattern in the matter, you know, and pattern is father, God. They were always introduced to the world of God. And that way, when he comes back, he's reintroduced into the tribe, he has a sense of dignity, a sense of meaning, a sense of legacy and responsibility to uh, live a certain way and to have a certain devotion to the tribe, to the people, but also to this eternal pattern that's moving through them, these, this, this new way of being as a man, not a boy any longer. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you're, well, obviously you're in spirituality and Hinduism to some degree, and I often, when I hear of, because I've been keeping up to speed with what you're doing with Grounding Camp, when I hear of Grounding Camp and when I see you as this uh, figurehead, as a part of this whole process, it reminds me of Hanuman and the army of monkeys. And mm -hmm. it's, it's literally like you're rounding them all up. And it's, you basically just described the whole process there. But it, it, it sounds very familiar. And it's almost like you're helping men to come into their own or realize themselves as men. Is, is that mm -hmm. accurate to say or fair to say? Yes, absolutely. It's 100%. <laughs> I like that you brought up Hanuman. Yeah, I resonate yeah. deeply with him. I, I love I love Hanuman and uh, and Ram and all of it and I'm big into Hinduism. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually I'm also big into samurai books and I, I don't if you don't mind I'm just going to read a little bit here from uh, uh, Haku uh, mm -hmm. Hagakure, which is uh, the book of the samurai and it has it's in relation to yin and yang of men and women and I want to get your opinion after I read this here. Mm -hmm. In the practice of medicine, this is from the book. In the practice of medicine, there's a differentiation of treatment according to the yin and yang of men and women. There is mm -hmm. also a difference in pulse. Over the past 50 years, men's pulse had become the same as women. Noticing this in the treatment of eye disease, this medicine practitioner in the book has had started applying women's treatment to men and found it actually to start being effective, whereas the men's treatment to men was no longer so. So it's almost as if the spirit of the man, the essence, had I've been gone, and I feel like this grounding camp that you're doing, and I feel like this whole process of, of leading men into coming into their own mm -hmm. is helping them regain that, that balance of themselves, helping to regain the, the yang aspect of, of their individual experience and, and how they move about the world. Um, yeah. So I just want to get your take on that, and if you, if you are into any samurai books or anything like that, but what, what do you think about that, that idea that over the past 50 or 100 years or so, 
It's almost like the spirit or essence of men, that masculine energy is being stripped away in some way. Mm -hmm. I just want to see what, what your take is and what you think might be causing that, that detachment. Well, we could look at it physiologically. We know that the uh, agricultural and industrial chemicals that uh, inundate, we're inundated with, I mean, and it's in our air, it's in our water, the plastics and the food, uh, the pesticides, they're feminizing. And so chemically we've been changed. Uh, they, I've even heard recently that birth control pills that women take when they piss into the water, you know, those are estrogens, uh, cannot be filtered out. They haven't found a way to get it out. So men are drinking water with estrogen in it. So chemically we've been altered. But then also socially, we've moved from a, uh, a world where men were introduced into the world of the father through initiation. But even when that began to lag in practice, there was always a deep connection to the father because the boys would work with the father, either in the farm or in creating weaponry or whatever it was. The father typically worked from home prior to the Industrial Revolution. And so there was a lot of father energy. There was a lot of masculine energy in the home. Now, uh, most fathers, a lot of fathers aren't even there. You know, we've got a government that, that, that makes, that gives prizes to women who don't have fathers in the home. So you get government subsidy for not having the father in the home. So there's, there's a uh, incentive not to have fathers. There's monetary incentive not to have fathers. Uh, lots of men are either working all day long uh, outside of the home, traveling miles and hours a day to go work somewhere away from their boys, away from their children. Uh, and if they are home, we live in a world uh, where women have been trained to compete with men in school, in sports, in, in every realm. So uh, men have taken a step back and allowed women to be men if they want to. And this is what we have. And in that, men have sort of sat down a little bit. And a lot of times in the home, the, the men behave more like children with the wife. And it's, you know, happy wife, happy life, and the woman rules the home. And when the woman rules the home, it really means the children rule the home. And so we've got this backwards order that's, quote, unquote, politically correct, which goes against the natural order, which is man leads the home. Man is in the home. And so uh, these boys who are raised mostly with weak fathers, absent fathers, and neurotic mothers then go to school all day long where something like 85, 90% of the teachers are women. So they, that not only are we being chemically changed, but we're being socially and psychologically changed. Uh, and so we've got a lost generation of beta blue pill boys who don't know what a man looks like. And when they're confronted with a man, they get very upset they get vi and resent them. And I know this is true because I experienced it in myself. My father's a very alpha male, but he didn't grow up the way we did. He grew up in Belize. And uh, you know, he came to America and had American children and put them in American schools. And we're taught all these American liberal ideas. And my father would be strong in the home and I would resent him as a, as a result because of what I saw on TV and what I heard at school. And it wasn't until much later in my life that I began to recognize just, uh, how right my father had been all this time by setting boundaries by what he liked to say, I'm, I, I'm the bad guy. Meaning like I set the rules, I make or break what goes on in this home, whether you like it or not, it does not matter to me. When I was young and when I was inexperienced and when I had that b blue pill conditioning, I resented my father. And that's why I can have compassion for and see why so many people hate Don Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump represents, regardless if you like his policies or not, most people don't even look at the policies. They're just emotional about their decision on him. But whether or not you like his policies, what most people resent is his, his alpha maleness, his willingness to be a tough guy and, to, and not to pander and to build walls, build boundaries, you see? So we've got a whole generation of uh, whiny teenage beta boys who are angry with strong alpha male leadership. And you know, you, what you resent, you can never become. So they hate leadership, they hate authority, they hate strength. And so they further perpetuate their own weakness.
Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like you mentioned Trump as well. And I, I do see him as this unwavering individual in, in his decisions and what, what he does. And it's almost unapologetic. And I notice mm -hmm. you are in a lot of ways unapologetically masculine in when you post content and, and whatnot. It, it triggers some people. And it's almost that same triggering that Trump would, would activate in, in those same people. Mm -hmm. So do you see this as, as a, there is a solution to this problem that's arisen? Do you, because it seems like, aside from having these conversations and, and creating content and holding these grounding camps, but do you see there as, as being a more viable long-term solution to help bring men back into just that, that sense of confidence and that, and that masculinity and even just in the home? Um, I don't have kids myself, I know you do. And as going through this process yourself, have you noticed that you change your behavior with your children or do you find that you've always been very masculine much like your father or do you find that you've kind of gone through an, an evolutionary process in some way where you've been discovering you know how to be a father how to have a family and it, well, what's your experience with that because i personally don't have the family i'm just really wondering how, what, what it is for uh what is it you that how, how you handle your family because um, even I, I wasn't raised by my father i was raised entirely by my mother so in, in some regard you described my upbringing in a lot of ways from an early age, I decided that I had to be my own father and kind of just took that upon myself. And I really almost thought that I, I would just make my own decisions and, and try and even at a very young age, try and manipulate my mother into going in with these decisions because uh, I knew that they would be in my best interest. So, but mm -hmm. as a family man yourself, um, first of all, do you see, foresee any, any solution to the problem? And, and what's been your experience just as a father? Well, the solution is that we have to stop thinking that women are going to do it. There's been this role reversal where we think that women can lead and that they should lead men, and that's not true. And so when we have that as a paradigm, we sit and wait. And what we do know, and what you understood intuitively as a child, is that women are much more easily manipulated. And they're not going to set the boundaries as hard as a father or as a, or, or as a strong alpha male leader will. So what I'm saying is that in, in order to get this going, men have to step up. We have to grab the steering wheel again. We have to be strong. And being strong means being hated. It means going against the grain. It means being un unapologetic. So there are going to be a lot of people, men and women, that don't like that. But women who are strong, and when I say strong women, I'm talking about feminine women, women who are strong in their femininity. Like, for example, my wife, she's a strong woman who gave birth naturally to four children at home. To me, that's stronger than a CEO woman because a CEO woman is weak. She's trying to be a man. She's not her strongest self in her femininity. A woman who knows how to, how many women give birth naturally these days? They're weak because they're weak in what makes them powerful. And what makes them powerful are to be great community builders, great child bearers, great mothers in the home. But the only way that's going to happen, and, and that requires a relaxing, women have become way too tense. And a part of the reason why they become tense is because men have become weak. And when men are weak, women have to toughen up. And I totally understand that. The dad's not here, I gotta toughen up. My husband's weak, I gotta toughen up. I don't trust this guy, I gotta toughen up. But when men step up and we become strong, when we grab the steering wheel, when we put our foot down, when we lead the tribe, then women can do this thank goodness. And they can relax and they can do what they do best, which is to nurture. I was talking yesterday with a friend about the nature of the sexes and how, you know, uh, men, it, uh, if you think about it in terms of boundaries, men are boundary setters and boundary pushers. And so what we would do is we'd create a safe space in the, in the middle where the woman can cultivate the future women would stay together with women in the middle where they would have children, they would care for the children, they would take what the men brought back and develop and create in the womb. A woman does best in a womb, a, a, a walled garden. Men, we protected the boundaries so that nobody could come in. You know, we live in this world, we think everybody's our friend. Not everybody's our friend. Not everybody's your friend. Not everybody wants the best for you. That's another feminine lie that we've been brainwashed with. There are people that want to destroy you. There are people that want to take what you have. And men knew that. We understood that. So we would protect the boundary. That we'd be out on the boundaries. 
and like you just think about walls like every this, i think it's so metaphorical that donald trump wants to build a wall and everybody's against the wall but that's the most masculine thing that a man does is protects what he loves my father used to he, he would say that all the time when i was a kid see this fence i built this fence because i protect and provide for everything inside of it anything outside of it comes secondary i even have to protect against those things on the outside and it's also a man's nature to expand, to reach out. That, think about the nature of the penis. What it does is it reaches out. And so there was always this conquest. Men provide boundaries and conquest. And so when we begin to honor that again, we, will, we could step into the strength of what makes us men and we can cr create the, real, the true safe space, not this bullshit that they talk about at universities today, the true safe space is the womb, is the place where women can relax and be great women. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's men stepping up and, and setting up the environment to allow those women to relax, to, to create the, the atmosphere almost. It's, I do yeah. have some friends and uh, they're, they're men obviously, and they go out and they have these very hardcore professions where they're either police officers or firefighters. And, real, and I notice when they go back into the home, they are very subservient to uh, their wives and their, you know, their family men as well. And so how, how would an individual like that in that circumstance kind of snap out of it and, and realize that they are being, because I do see them as children. I, a lot of these men I've known growing up from a very early age, so I knew their parents and I knew this. And that. It's almost like I saw them from a, a teenager uh, being subservient to their mothers. And then when they were, um, you know, not married, they're going out and trying to find women and this and that. But the second they landed the woman, got married, got in the house, they went back into this way of being that they were when they were teenagers. To the point where it's like not even making their own meals for the evening. You know, we're talking basic shit, like take care of yourself, right? Like step up and, and take care of yourself. And I, I'm just wondering how someone would snap out of that way of being and come to that realization if they are just going to the job, coming home, and then just allowing the woman to take care of everything from, you know, either that's house chores or uh, even taking out the garbage and stuff like that or preparing meals. But, like, how can someone make that, that shift? Is there, is, there some, well, is, there some, like, is there some introspective work they can do? Is there something, do you recommend any reading materials or what would, what would you suggest? Yeah, I'll be very practical because I was gonna, I was going to give you some pretty philosophical ideas, and we could go there in a moment if you'd like. Sure. But the very first thing that the man needs to have is a vision for his family. You cannot lead if you don't know where you're going, and a woman can't trust you and relax in her femininity if she doesn't trust that you have a vision for the relationship, a vision for the children, a vision for the family. If you ask these men who have j their jobs, you ask them, "What is it that you're?" striving for what is it that that you're building where is it where are we going with this a man must have a mission that's super important so you've got to decide on your mission and what supports a mission are boundaries so what rules do you now live by and what is good for the goose is good for the gander meaning this is how we live our life in our home these are the rules these are the things that we don't believe these are the things that we do believe. And that's very hard living in this world where you're inundated with all kinds of backwards information and ideas that come from the media, it comes from the school, they're brainwashing the children. What we have is a world where the children are being raised by the state. That's really what we have. And the father has lost all his authority in the home. He's got all the responsibility and none of the authority. He's actually last on the totem pole because the woman could very easily undercut him by going right to the state either through divorce law or through, uh, through the education, basically through everything we depend on the state. So the state is our daddy now. And so I understand the challenge there. And this is why, this is the, now I'm gonna go in the other direction, going a little bit more philosophical, but this is a big piece, part of the reason why religion is making a comeback. Because men always need an eternal authority. Right now our authority is in the state, it's not in the divine. And so when a man has, when a man is subject to the authority of an eternal father, a God the Father, and the boundaries thereof, the, the Taoists would say walking with the Tao, walking with the way, or walking with God, then he, he receives a divine authority in the home that he could lean on and lead his family with. 
And so I see that one of the, one of the practical ways to bring that back into, into the home is to remove reliance on the state. I think homeschooling is going to continue to, to, to rise. I think people are going to, and you see it happening now. People are starting to, to move out of the urban areas and they're wanting to move back into, the, into where they can cultivate land. They can create their own food, create their own communities. We've got to get off of the tip of the state, the matrix. The word matrix comes from matter, material, mother also too. We've got to move out of that, cultivate our own sense of self-reliance, and then depend on the father, depend on the eternal, the eternal pattern. And so religion has, especially in the West, has become very beta, has become very feminized. Christianity has become very feminized. And this is why most men don't resonate with Christianity, and I understand why. Because, you know, a lot of these churches, they're, they're no better than going to, you know, uh, elementary school in, uh, in public schools. And so uh, what we're going to need to do and what is, I know is happening, I'm seeing it happening. And I recognize myself as a spark, meaning that what's happening in my heart is a mirror reflection of what's going to be happening and it is happening in the world. And, uh, and this is a return to the austerity and the boundary setting and the, you know, this, this term has, is, 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 has leaves a lot of people feeling b bad, but like the wrathful father the strong father, the father that's not worried about your feelings, the father that's worried about your well-being and your survival. I don't care how you feel about this. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. This is what we're doing. And because I say so, you see, that rubs a lot of people the wrong way, but this is what has to come back in this world of chaos. Mm -hmm. It's the no, the no bullshit father with that foresight to back it, right? It's, it's knowing where to go, knowing the direction, and even utilizing that vision and setting some goals of, you know, in, in the family life as well. I know you touched on the state just there and, and you've been married for several years. Um, I say out of convenience that I'm married, but I've been living with my wife, let's say, for almost 12 years now. We're not officially signed married with the state. And I know you have some opinions on this because I've caught some videos here or there of you discussing it. What are your thoughts on that? The difference between a monogamous relationship where you're living together, you're you have that bond and that connection versus actually going and signing some documents at city hall and doing it under government rule or, or law. Right. Well, once again, the government has become our daddy. The government has become our God. If you think that you're an atheist, you're not because you pledge all allegiance to the government. And so when you sign that marriage document, you're acknowledging that you're giving over a normal and natural urge, primordial urge, God given urge to uh, to, to pair bond to the government. What we did before that was it was in the realm of the, of the religion. It was in the realm of the church. But I say since, you know, things have been broken down to such a degree that it has to build back up from its constituent parts, that when a man and a woman have chosen, like yourself, to be monogamous, to be together for 12 years, and if you're having sex with her, she is your wife. And I'm happy that you said that. I tell that to young men all the time. You know, they'll tell me that they're, you know, I've been with this girl for a couple of years and they're having sex. And I'm like, well, she's your wife. You don't need the state to tell you that she's your wife. You don't need, and the, and the state will tell you she's your wife because they've got this common law marriage bullshit. Yeah, yeah. So, like my accountant deals with all that for sure. <laughs> yeah, common law. Yep. Wow. So the state will tell you what to do, but you take it upon yourself because that is a union between yourself, that woman and God. So you don't need the church. You don't need the government. You don't need anybody to tell you. What you need is a sense of dignity, a sense of devotion, and a sense of commitment to your own personal evolution through the relationship with this woman. And so divorce is even out of the question, even though you haven't gotten a state marriage, you know, because I'm devoted. That's very manly. It's very manly to be devoted. It's very masculine to be committed. It's very m masculine to give your life over to a greater cause. And the relationship means more than us individually. Mm -hmm. And I like you've touched on previously that having that long-term monogamous, monogamous relationship allows the freeing up of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've experienced that because I've had, you know, buddies over the past 12 years running around, chasing around, going here and there and here and there. I don't bother with it. And I actually even get mentally exhausted with the thought of the mm. process. Oh yeah. So, like, apps and whatnot. And you can swipe to find a new mate and all this other stuff. Like it's, I've never even gone there, but um, 
I, just, I, I wanted to get your opinion on, on the marriage side of things, even from people that get married but don't have a monogamous, monogamous relationship. It's almost like I feel it's some kind of weird backwards perversion of the whole concept. Is, do, you, do you know anyone that, that's like that? I mean, I've seen people online and they promote it as like a, almost a healthy way of being to, <laughs> to be married but be in an open marriage. And it's like, to me, it's a very confusing concept. And I think it's yeah. part of that whole just cluster of information and all this backwards logic that's being thrown at people that they don't really know what to follow, what to do. And I, I find that they're constantly looking to external things rather than just looking inwards at like what is best or in that individual's best interest. So I want to get your take on that non-monogamous yeah. marriage. This uh, promiscuity in men is a byproduct of our feminization also too. And so there's a really wonderful book uh, written by Jack Donovan called The Way of Man. And in it, he talks about something that a lot of new agers love, but you know, it's quote unquote science uh, that you know, evolutionary scientists are moving away from this idea that we're, we're like chimps and in fact, more like bonobos. And I think, that, I think the agenda there is to make us like the bonobo, which is this, what you got to understand, the difference between the chimp and the bonobo is that the bonobo lived in a society where there was zero competition for food. And as a result, there was lots of women and lots of sex. And so the women typically leaded, led, and the men kind of, they like, he calls it the bonobo masturbation society. They would just, they would hang around, they would loaf around. They had nothing to do because they didn't need to go get food. There was no threat. The bonobos have no threat. They, it, where the bonobos live, there are no invading, uh, you know, other, other animals that are gonna come and take their food or kill them or eat them. They've got no threats and they got a ton of food. Think about our society. Um, and so it becomes matriarchal. It's a matriarchal society. The women, it's so relaxed that the more relaxed of the sexes can lead. And men just kind of jerk off. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the other end of the spectrum is the chimp. And the chimp, they, first of all, they eat meat, unlike the bonobos. So they got to hunt. They got to go get their food. They got to fight for their food. They got to protect against most of the environments where the chimps live. They got to protect against invading ch other chimps because chimps are, are patriarchal and masculine in their way of setting boundaries and conquest. And the women stayed within so that they could, and, the, and there were very few women. Women were highly prized. You know, women who hear me saying these things and they don't like the way it sounds. Well, maybe because there's too much of you and it's pretty cheap. Sex is cheap. Mm -hmm. Pussies everywhere. Mm -hmm. Vagina is vagina. What's the big deal? They're a dime a dozen now. Well, when it was a patriarchy and when, uh, you know, we talk about the chimp, women were highly prized. The females were highly prized because they represent the future. And so other, tr other tribes would come in and want to steal the women because when you have women, you can have children. And so you have more, you know, you can, you can proliferate. So anyway, I brought that up just because, uh, I thought it was interesting. <laughs> but as far as uh, m having multiple partners, it just, to me, it just doesn't sound practical. Shit. Like, my woman takes enough of my energy that I couldn't imagine if I had to satisfy or to be with or to, or, or to chase down or to d deal with any more than one woman. It couldn't, it, it's not practical because I've got so many other things that I want to do to direct my energy towards. So, you know, I've got my opinions on that, but I also believe that evolutionary, evolutionarily, religiously, spiritually, emotionally, we're designed to pair bond. We're designed to marry. We're designed to be kings in a castle, not brothels. Mm -hmm. And do you think it, it's some kind of unconscious distraction or maybe even conscious to some degree that these men are going out and speaking? I know some buddies like that as well. It's like a part-time job having to bounce around and see all these different people, all these different women mm -hmm. and go on dates and everything. Yeah. I, it's a I, part of the feminization. It's a part of the feminization of our society. To be attached to pussy is to be attached to the material. To be attached to the material world is a part of the matrix or the Maya. The word matrix, Maya, maternity, mother, material world. It's our over-attachment to sensuality feeling, feeling good. I want to go get my nut off. Oh, I want to, I want the emotional, I want the emotional roller coaster of falling back in love. You see, it's all this attachment to sensuality. It's very weak. 
men who need to have lots of women, you know, it looks like it's cool, but it's not. It's an addiction. It's an addiction. And not only is it an addiction that makes you weak and proves you're, 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 that you're overly feminized and that you get the mind of a woman, but it also puts women in charge. Because what happens when a man puts a pussy on the pedestal, he's got to do whatever he has to do. He has to change his character. He has to be a certain way. He has to bite his tongue at certain times so that he doesn't disrupt the flow of pussy his way. And so he, so he very quickly loses himself in the world of the matrix. Because when you put pussy on the pedestal and you put women in charge, you got a bunch of men bowing down and kowtowing so that they don't disrupt that flow of sensuality. I, I like this idea of MGTOW. You know, I'm a married man and I just learned about MGTOW about a year, two years ago. And this whole idea of men refraining from needing women, refraining from, women have been doing this for the past 50 years. We don't need no man. Well, yeah, because you got big daddy government taking care of you. You didn't have big daddy government taking care of you. And we were constantly at threat of being invaded. And you needed to nourish yourself by not going to, taking your food stamps to the convenience store. You would need men, big time. But Ooh. men, <laughs> men really don't need women. We need women for the future. But men protect, men provide, men are stronger. And so uh, without the government, women, you know, they, they, would, they would be feminine again. They would relax and allow men to be what men are. But instead, we got, you know, bonobo masturbation society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw you did, uh, it was an Instagram video on that, right? Just recently. Mm -hmm. On the chimps versus the, the bonobos. <laughs> yep. Um, to, just to shift gears a little bit, uh, because you're in the public eye so much, and I know you took a little bit of a break from YouTube, when was that? It was like a few years ago now, right? When you hit a million subscribers approximately and you took a little bit of a break from that. Yep. Um, how do you deal with being in that public eye? Like being just the overwhelming flow of information constantly coming in, the notifications, the, the emails, the everything. And, and I assume that was part of that process as well, but you're just taking out a little bit of a break. Just to Boundaries. Read. Yeah. Oh, it is just creating boundaries. Perfect. Yeah. It's, Taught it's, me how to be a man. Uh -huh. when, I first, when I first became famous, I was much more beta. I was much more feminized. You know, I grew up the same way you did and all of us, you know, in this, in this society where Homer Simpson is the avatar daddy, that and the government's strong. So uh, I didn't know how to handle it. And I got attached to the material of it, meaning the feeling of it, the feeling of being famous and the, and the excitement of it, all that emotional feminine bullshit. Uh, and I didn't know how to handle it. And so what, what forced me, and this is, you know, part of the reason why I talk in this, in this way about masculinity and femininity is because I've had to go through a, a series of my own evolutions to come to this place, was you've got to detach, you've got to set up boundaries, and you've got to be stoic in your approach to both the good and the bad. So be unmoved. So, you know, there, yeah, there's a constant flow coming at me, but I don't have to see it all. In fact, I don't see it all. I don't want to see it all. People email me, man. I don't, I'm not going to get to your email. You send me a DM. I'm not going to get to your DM. You say, have comments. I'm, people want to argue with me in the comment section. And, and they're the weak ones because they're all emotional and, and active, you know, Ooh, feeling and doing, feeling and doing, feeling and doing, which is very, it's very feminine. It's very matrix. It's very attached to the material. It's very sensual. It's very emotional. They think that I owe them some sort of response. <laughs> I said what I said because I felt like saying it and putting it out there. And they want to bait me into some, some sort of a tangle with them. They want me to dance with them. And I don't, I don't owe you that. They're, and and, and it, doesn't make, it doesn't make you strong to want to do that because who argues through uh, message boards? Like, that's a waste of time to me. So mm -hmm. I don't see any of that shit. I'm more interested in just expressing myself as an artist does than anybody's feedback. Mm -hmm. I, I do get that in your posts and I do notice people kind of coming in the comments, even people that are verified or have a lot of followings themselves. I almost like wonder why are you taking that time to, yeah. to you know, I, I see your content. I, even if it's, I'm never really triggered by it, but I see that other people are, even if it is, yeah. just leave it be. It's it, Elliot expressing himself and I don't, I do get, their responses. It's these like enraged, you know, <laughs> long drawn out paragraphs. And then 
I don't know if you do it on purpose, but your response is often like two, three words. <laughs> and it, it, again, un unapologetic, and that just sets them off. I imagine them having to go for a walk after seeing that, but you know, just getting so heavily into it. Um, so I guess it, that's a great way that you describe it. You, you just maintain your center, and even your responses, they do seem very stoic in a lot of ways. And, and this yeah. is very much a Buddhist philosophy of maintaining the center. You know, the wheel's spinning so fast, you get caught on the outside, or you go flying. Mm -hmm. You just maintain that center and that, that groundedness. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I get that from your replies. So, um, yeah, very cool. Very cool. How you deal with all, all, all that attention, all that spotlight. It's important for us not to need to be liked. Um, and that's yeah. tough. You know, it's tough in a lot of ways. It's tough as a father and it's tough as a businessman. You know, there's an old Chinese saying that man who doesn't smile shouldn't open up shop, but I understand, you know, if you want to make money, you gotta, you gotta make people like you, but, uh, I'm over that. I'd rather be broke. I don't need your money. I don't need your attention. I don't need you. I don't need you to like me. And so I think that's another, you know, we talked about my dad and Donald Trump. I think you really, you're really starting to crystallize your own masculinity when you can say what you say with conviction, even though you may be wrong and not give a shit what anybody thinks or says. I'm willing to be wrong, but Ralph Waldo Emerson says, say today what you're convinced of, what you, the conviction that you have today with as much might as you can, even though tomorrow you may contradict yourself completely. It has nothing to do with being right or wrong. It's about putting your foot down and being a man. It's conviction that's important. People are more, too, more attached to being right than, be, than having conviction. And I think that's, a, I think that's, I don't think that helps. I think that's a wrong way to be, especially in this day and age where, look, we were talking about vegan and, and carnivore. Look, you can, you can dig up all kinds of valid scientific research to validate both of those. What matters are not the facts. The facts don't matter anymore. It's your conviction and it's your willingness to put your foot down and to sit quietly in your knowing, regardless of the tumult of opinions around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, and it's really acknowledging that you are a being that's in an evolutionary process yourself mm -hmm. because you can't just say, I'm right here on this day and this time tomorrow, mm -hmm. who knows, right? Like you have to accept you're constantly going to evolve. Your opinion might change and evolve over time with with that so yeah um so do you have any meditative practice that you employ either just to, and i know you just started getting a bit into yoga more so i saw some yoga poses and whatnot uh which is a little awkward even i'm, I'm kind of like a big guy myself so whenever i try and get into these yoga positions like my wife she's very she's like like slender skinny 110 pounds she looks flawless i did a youtube video with her watched it back i was like i look like a stone ogre trying to do these damn poses <laughs> and she looks like like, this is amazing, you know, like the hand goes up all slow and stuff. I, I feel like a goofball doing it. But do you have any meditative practice outside of uh, the, the yoga that you've been starting to take on? I didn't really get into yoga for meditation. I got into it because everything I've done in the gym has been so angular for so many years. And so I wanted to, do, I wanted to experiment with circular movement and breathing. And so it was more physiological and physical, biomechanical that I went into yoga. Um, but I've been meditating my most successful uh, tool, the thing that I've used more than any and continuously go back to are frequencies, binaural beats. And I use Holosync. I've been using Holosync for, you know, going on 12, 12 years. And so uh, I find it to be very resourceful in helping me maintain a groundedness and a focus uh, just by using this scientific discovery of how sound waves and frequencies change the brain. Right. I mean, and you, know, you were into Buddhism and stuff like the Buddhist monks would they would use gongs. Frequencies, because mm -hmm. you would change you change the frequencies, you change the brain. And so it's no different than that. We, it's something we may have known for thousands of years. I once heard I heard recently that um, a lot of the pyramids in Egypt were designed to be sound tunnels. And that they're designed in such a way that, uh, that sound frequencies would reverberate through them and people would go, and that's where they would meditate. They would go into these sound tunnels. Mm. So sound. Sound is a, a very powerful way to adjust our frequency. And so I see it as meditation. I also like practicing stillness and stoicism. And, you know, as the Greek Orthodox Christian, Christians take really great care to remind themselves that we are to pray unceasingly and to have little, and that means just to have little mantras, 
little mantras all day long when you find that your frequency is being knocked off path. It is, it's very centering to have a little, just a little mantra for yourself. So the, the, the Eastern Orthodox would say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it's just a, it's just a very humbling mantra that like, I'm not in charge. I can't make this shit happen. There's no reason to be anxious. There's no reason to try to rush. There's no reason to be depressed. Have mercy on me. And so I like to use a lot of little, little mantras like that or just silent sitting. Mm -hmm. And that's very yielding as well, right? That's very uh, allowing. Surrendering, basically, you're surrendering all the chaos. You're surrendering your thoughts. You're sur just surrendering yourself to that moment and just mm -hmm. allowing yourself to be with it. Um, so during these meditations, do you find that you have certain insight, intuition? I know you talk about a mission or a cause that you take it upon yourself. Do you find that these reinforce that or reinforce your confidence when you, when you get to these? It's almost like you take a break from the world. I, I call, 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 sorry, I almost call it going into the void. It's like you, you dip into the void and you find you come back out and you have some sort of new insight intuition of the direction you should be taking with either content or mm. you know, interview or whatever it may be that you mm -hmm. be experiencing on that day or that month. I used to think that was the case, but I discovered that I was bullshitting myself. And then I would go into this stillness and I would have these thoughts or these feelings come up and I trusted them. And quickly I began to realize and I, and I reformulated, uh, well, number one, I don't trust any of my thoughts any longer. I don't trust any of my emotions. I, I bring them all into account because I don't know if they're of me or not because many of our thoughts, which we think are our thoughts, are not our thoughts. They're your mom's thoughts, they're your dad's thoughts, they're the media's thoughts, they're your school teacher's thoughts, they're your wife's thoughts. There are their hopes, fears, ambitions, and dreams that you that leave an imprint. And so you think you're having a thought, oh, I should do this, but really you're just having someone else's thought. What I have found and, and have grounded myself in this and moved from this place today is to allow revelation to lead me. And revelation is about being present to see what's being presented to you in every moment of the day. Some people would call it omens. So if I don't know what to do, I'm not gonna sit quietly until a spark comes, an idea comes. I'm going to be still in my day until I can see the path making its, opening itself up. What meditation does is not deliver the downloads and insight in my experience and the way I'm describing it today. That's not what it's about. It's about cleansing clearing out all the bullshit so that when you're in your walking day, you start to see all the synchronicities, mm. you start to see all the things line up, you know, and the more we're relaxed, the more we're open, the more we're aware, we start to see, ah, you know, there are certain synchronicities and that I, and I do believe in omens because I know that the physical world is a mere reflection of the metaphysical world. It's a spectrum. So a lot of times we'll start to see, coincidences or synchronicities or even like you know people get into the numbers and stuff but there's something to be said for that because it is the metaphysical world imprinting itself and letting you know what's going on in a realm that you cannot see so and then when you're confused about what to do and you allow you relax you meditate and you allow to, and, and you walk the path of revelation <laughs> All kinds of crazy, just, it becomes so obvious. You know, a lot of guys are wanting, wanting to know what to do. And then if you just get out of the way, it almost becomes like, duh. Sometimes, like, I can see it. A lot of times it's harder for us to see ourselves than for others to see us. And, so, and it takes a long time for us to see ourselves, even if someone else is telling you. Um, but I'll look at someone who, they don't know their path, but I'm looking at them, I'm like, I know your path. I know exactly what you're supposed to be doing, because you've been doing it. It's, it's what your whole, like, when you asked me before about, strong man and being a strength coach and leading men and making men strong. Uh, I didn't really choose that. And I look back in my life and I'm like, I didn't choose that. I didn't choose that. I didn't choose that. It was revealed to me. And so now I don't necessarily look at it in terms of like, this is my mission and I chose this. I look at this as this is what I've been put here for. This is, this is the path as it's been revealed to me in my, throughout my entire life. I can't deny it. I've tried to deny it. I've tried to do other things. That was a part of, you know, my stopping making YouTube videos and doing yoga and all that shit. That was me trying to like steer the boat. And it just took me off track, which was fine. That was a part of the journey also. But 
when I began to wake up again and realize and, and, and decide like, okay, I'm going to get active again. Well, what am I going to get active in? Who are you? I'm strong man, strength coach, CEO of strength camp, make man strong. That's me. There's no question about it. And mm -hmm. so we can all get, get to that place where we can look at our lives and see it's reflection of our own consciousness. It's very easy to follow the right path. Do you get a sense that your future self beckons to you in the present? This is a all the time. And that is a bad thing. It's, it, it is distracting as fuck. Uh, and uh, that's where, that's where I've gotten lost the most because I have, I know what's coming. I can see it. A younger version of me would see it and get anxious. Like, Oh, now I got to go make that happen. I got to, I got to go get it. And it's going to go away. If I don't do something now, what do I need to do? I need to write down and go. I, and so I get very frantic about making the vision happen. And, and that wastes a lot of energy and takes you way off course sometimes. And I've seen that and I've seen myself go way off course just to come right back to like, Oh, here it is. And I didn't even do it. It happened. I didn't know how it was going to happen. So we're attached to the how we were attached to the when. But now when I sense my future beckoning, I just have gratitude for it as it's here now. I see it because there's a lot of things that like are in me and that I know I'm being called to that when I look at my life, I'm like, I don't, I have no idea how that's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I look at it and I feel it and I acknowledge it and I appreciate it because I know it's, it's going to happen. <laughs> you know, so I can relax. Yeah, it's a hot come, come to me, you, right? Yeah, I let it come to me. I don't have to go to it. I'm gonna let it come to me. Mm -hmm. And now, by doing those meditative practices, you—it's almost like you—you you clear the lens and you go with total awareness into this experience, right? Where you now can see those synchronicities and and associate to, associate them to that happening. Does that make sense? Yeah, just watch them. I have to. You gotta have two eyes. You gotta watch yourself. And you got to watch the omens. You got to watch the path as it's being revealed to you. So one eye on myself and my, and when I say eye on myself, I got to take a look at my weaknesses. I got to look at my demons. I got to constantly know where I'm about to get in my own way. Whoop, there's an old tendency. That's not, that's not needed. You don't need to do that. You can relax. But then also seeing and acknowledging the omens as they appear and they're being revealed to you. So if you're, if, when I'm completely present, I can put the, put the pieces together, put the puzzle pieces together as they're presented to me. It, and, and if you know anything about puzzles, the pieces, when they're individual, they, they look like, what the hell is this? I don't know what this is. I don't know where it goes, what, how it fits into the big picture, but it's like, hmm. But then like, like someone who's uh, putting a puzzle together, you start to see the other pieces that have the same color on it and you start putting them together. And you start realizing, oh boy, this piece goes over here and oh, here's another piece that has the same sort of color. And then the picture starts to emerge. And then like, it, it, there's wonder associated with it. Oh, like, wow, that weird thing that happened to me. Sometimes a tragedy. I, had no, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. I don't know where I'm gonna put that. I don't know what that's about, but you allow it. You walk the path and all of a sudden you start to see, ah, that's where it goes. This is what it's a part of. And this is what it's building. Mm -hmm. Is that that duh moment? Yeah, you get the duh moments. Well, I get a lot of duh moments because I'm a doer. I'm an actor. I want to. I, I want to take it. I want to take it by the horns. And I want to make it happen. So you know, I'm 40 years old now. I've had quite a bit of life experience, so that I can say duh to myself, and I can and I can I can avoid a lot of the mistakes I made. Now again, you know, some people they make, keep making the same mistakes until they die, but I can see myself now, and as I'm about to go do what I used to do or to l allow that those old patterns, that old karma to come up. I go, duh, I don't need to do that. <laughs> I'm just wasting my time. Mm -hmm. There's a certain lightheartedness in, in the way you, you kind of express that there too. And, and I love that because it, it is taking away the seriousness of the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Love it. So have you had any psychedelic experiences? With the so, uh, not necessarily. I, I used what I think was called DMT. I think it was DMT uh, once, but it was after years and years of doing bioenergetics. 
And what I recently, dis- and fasting, what I recently discovered, ah, so fascinating. I had a myriad of different psychedelic experiences through the use of my own internal DMT. Mm. I just learned that fasting gets you to a point where your brain begins to release its own DMT. And I remember having these euphoric, mind-blowing revelations and, and experiences uh, that I couldn't put into context. I was just like, because oh, I would do a lot of bioenergetics. I was working with a bioenergetic analyst for many years, and I do a lot of deep breathing. And like, you know, it changed me chemically, mentally, physically, emotionally. And so to say that I have a psychedelic experience, yeah. I had natural psychedelic experience through fasting and deep breathing. Mm-hmm. So I was even going to ask you that question earlier with the meditation or having it associated with meditation because I, I feel you can't achieve those things completely naturally. I've had a few psychedelic experiences myself uh, with actual substances, with the DMT and with some mushrooms as well. Uh, and, and I do, it, it does feel very closely related to what I've, what I've done prolonged fasts, the amount of clarity even I get from just yeah. that. Um, so it's really powerful, it's really, really powerful. Yeah. So I want to ask you, because you're a big jack dude, have you heard about anatomy trains, which has to do with the body's fascia? Yeah, yeah, I read, uh, I don't remember the author, Myers, Myers? Yes, yes, that's right. I'm just starting to get into it. That's why I wanted to get your opinion. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I had his book back in like 2002. Yeah, very fascinating stuff. Amazing stuff. Yeah, it changed my way of thinking about the body. Uh, and do you get any body work done right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in fact, <laughs> I just wrote down before we got on a call that I want to go get this new massage gun I saw somebody had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The what is it called? Type thing. <laughs> yeah, jackhammer. I don't know the name of it, but I'm going to go Google it. It looks like a jackhammer. Up. I'm like, yeah, because I could use that in my glutes and IT bands for sure now that I've been lifting stones again. Mm-hmm. And I want to go get that and do that. But I've worked with neurosomatic therapist, neuromuscular therapist, uh, uh, energetic, uh, structural energetic therapist. I've worked with so many different types of uh, body. And what do you find to be the most effective modality for treatment? A combination of body work and breath work. Mm. Because it, there, we're, we're a spectrum. And to work on the body without allowing the breath to be open, uh, we, just, we just tense right back up. So when I've when I work with bioenergetic analysts and, uh, and really good ones, you know, and, uh, and structural energetic therapists, they would be doing body work on me and I'm shouting, ah, ah, but it's not a, you know, most people think of shouting as like, uh, because they're resisting and they're shouting as something that's like, they're going to pop. When I shout, I open my throat and I open my inner tube and it's, it's basically like relaxing. Oh, it's like almost like I'm chanting. So they're like working deep into my tissue, deep into my belly, deep and creating this pain that's only there if I resist. And resisting looks like, <clears throat> which most people do. And you can't shout at most massage therapists. So when I go work with these guys and they're, they're putting me through the ringer, changing my structure by working the fascia, I'm also changing the, my energy with the yell, with the shouting mm-hmm. it's like you're not shouting from your from your head right you're shouting from like your, your gut right you're really yeah. just getting it all out is that yeah. part of uh one of the i noticed in grounding camp where you have the, the men actually start to shout is that is that part of that process big time remember we spoke about frequencies and vibration before yeah well you know you could do it externally with the sound or, or the gongs it's happening to us all day long. We're bombarded with all kinds of frequencies from the computers, from the cell phones, from the towers. I mean, ooh, that's why we're all fucking crazy. But sound coming up out of the body is a primal frequency that we can begin to resonate with to find our own voice. I just made that up. To find our own voice. Your voice is a frequency. And so by opening up and reducing the tension, getting all the restriction and the blockages out of the inner tube, which is from the pelvic floor to the top of the head. Oh, you begin to change your frequency. You begin to change your, you get out of your way. In order for it to be full and flowing, restrictions got to move. So a lot of people, like when we do grounding camp, we do a lot of shouting. The first day, a lot of people, like their throats are all fucked up. And they got to like whisper for the next few days. Well, that's because 
you're locked up and you're, you're shouting through resistance. What I'm trying to help you do through a lot of the deep breathing is find that space where there's just complete relaxation and, and vibration. Mm -hmm. I find I get that same, does it have to do with, I mean, aside from all the signals, and society, what are your thoughts on sleep and sleep positioning and whatnot? I find that I get really locked up, especially in the throat area, you know, right after waking up and, and to kind of to follow up with that. Did you, do you have any practice that you do right in the morning to kind of set you up, like set you up for the day to have a nice opened up you know, high energy day, you know, where you, where you don't feel lethargic, you just feel great. Do you have any sort of five, 10 minute, half hour routine that you do in the mornings? My favorite thing to do in the morning to get that going is to go on a walk, pumping. Pumping. So a lot of people will do like rebounding, but it, it massages the body, massages the organs, gets the heart going. It's like starting the engine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you use, um, kind of related stuff. Do you use uh, those five finger shoes or any of those minimalist shoes? No. Okay. No. I, I'm sure you usually kind of into that stuff with grounding and whatnot. I think it's cool. I think it's good. Uh, I just, I've done it and I, I don't like it. <laughs> okay. When I'm walking and when I'm running, I don't like it. I'm heavy and I've got some muscular imbalances due to injuries and the loading just doesn't feel good on mm -hmm. my body. Yeah. Yeah. Before. I get what so, you mean. But I do go barefoot and, and like the type of uh, footwear I wear when I'm weight training a lot of times is minimal, minimalist because I'm not pounding. I'm just, I'm standing there and I'm lifting something. But if I'm going to be out there with that repetitive pounding, that destroys me. Right, right. All right. Well, what, what are your goals right now over the next year, let's say? I know you want to do that strongman competition. When is that? So it's about three months, you said? August, the end of August, last weekend of August, August okay. 31st, Strength Camp Challenge. Where you yourself going over the next year? I know you've started your podcast, and I, mm -hmm. did you have a couple guests on there? I saw some um, astronomer, was it? Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, her name's like skipping my mind, but um, I know you're doing your podcast. Are you, do you do weekly guests on that now? What, where do you foresee that over the next year as well? So I'm not very ambitious about it. <laughs> Wherever it goes is where it goes. Uh, I'm having fun with it right now. Mm -hmm. Just talking to people, just chatting, yapping it up. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really, I'm just having fun. I, right. As far as my, I, I, I don't really have any goals, but I have this, I have the visions. You know what I talked about before, like having the visions and being pulled towards it. To me, that looks a lot like getting out of the way and allowing what I'm supposed to be doing to be revealed to me on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Now, it doesn't mean I don't look at a calendar because we do live based on these, these physical laws. So I do, look at, I do look out and I do have things on calendars and I use my calendar. It's probably my, my favorite tool. I've got a big one on the other side of this board. But I kind of allow these things to reveal themselves to me. Like I didn't know I was going to be doing a strongman show, which is perfect. Like I'm so excited about it uh until last friday like i just made that up like that just came to me i was working out i was making a video the few days earlier my partner uh, shrimp, at shrimp camp said hey we're getting ready to do the shrimp camp challenge this year i need you to make some videos and then like in the middle of me doing a live stream i was like i'm gonna do the shrimp camp challenge it just came it was just revealed and so there's this there's this balance between allowing, but then being disciplined about the, the allowing. How can I say this? So the example with the strength camp challenge is perfect. It was revealed to me that I'm gonna do the strength camp challenge. I had not been planning this for years, but now that I know I'm gonna do it, I went to my calendar right away. I was like, whoop, I got 16 weeks. I got these amount of workouts. I got this kind of, I need to gain this amount of weight. I need to be able to hit these numbers. Boom, 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 boom. So I let the goals be given to me and then I structure how I'm going to get them. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to really set take action, right? Like you really get after it. I mean, it, it seems like right, right away, it's like, I'm going to do this. All right. And you make a plan of how you're going to execute this thing. That's really cool. So do you find that it's because of getting back to the meditation that you, that these things come in and then you can, 
you see see them with such a clear vision that you know like this is this is that path and I'm, I'm going to go down it and you just have such confidence in doing so I don't know if it's a meditation, but I can tell you that it has a lot to do with self-love and self-trust. Or in the past, I would overthink. I would overthink it, you know? So I would, I would rationalize. Now, when things come to me, I accept them for what they are and then move with it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm contradicting myself. If you listen long enough, you'll hear me contradict myself constantly. And I know I'm doing a lot of that right now. And that's a part of the self-love also. And so my answer is, uh, <laughs> my answer is both. It's allowing it to be received and then taking action as hard as you can. Cool, very cool. So we're, we're uh, almost coming up on an hour and a half now, so I'll, I'll wrap this up. But I do have one final question. It is revolving around self-love. It's a question that I do get on my YouTube channels and all that stuff. Um, a lot of people, I guess they're trying to find self-love externally. And I've tried to explain as best I can, especially from even psychedelic experiences or deep sort of transcendental meditation experiences, that this love is naturally inherent the second you're born. It's mm -hmm. as breath, it's as heartbeat. And I find so many people, and they use the term, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be worthy, or I'm trying to accept that I'm worthy of self-love. And, and it's such a contradictory statement because how can you be worthy of something that's natural to you, naturally inherent in your being? Mm -hmm. So how, what, what can be said to people to create that perceptional shift where they say, I, I am just in love. I am always in love. It's not something that I can, I can take or give or anything. It's just naturally there. And it's just a matter of opening oneself up to it, much akin to Hanuman Christ, opening up the chest, revealing the heart, accepting it all, embracing it all. So what, what actionable advice could you give someone that's having difficulty with self-love worthiness, finding worthiness that, that, they're, that they're basically deserving of this. Well, the reason why you talk that way is because you're evaluating yourself and judging yourself and you're trying to play God. That's very arrogant for people to do that. You can't evaluate yourself. You don't know what you're actually doing. You don't know why you're really here. You don't know God's plan for you. So you can't judge yourself based on the laws of man, you know? So, um, most, for the most part, all of our judgments against ourselves are other people's judgments. That's why I said before, you can't trust yourself. Don't trust your, not yourself, but don't trust your thoughts. If you're telling yourself that you, you're trying to make yourself worthy, that means you have a standard of what worthy means. And God loves you unconditionally. So it doesn't matter. God loves the beggar and the burglar just as much as he loves the priest. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. God is trying to experience himself through all human beings in every walk of life. And any judgment or evaluation that you have of yourself is you trying to play God and, and, and blocking God uh, and, and his experience through you. So to have unconditional self-love is to love yourself the way God loves you. And do you think that this, this judgment of oneself is something that, that has been learned? I know you talked earlier about mm -hmm. genera generationally things are learned. And I don't know if you're familiar with Rupert Sheldrake's work on Warwick Residence. Oh, I love it. And it's very much like that. It's this, it's this judgment that's been learned and people adopt it as, as like this default way of being. And I think that that creates those blockages. So um, I guess I'm just wondering how people can, can get rid of just do away with all that judgment of oneself. Don't trust really. your thoughts. Yeah. Don't believe your thoughts. That's a, like a rummy, uh, isn't it, as well? Examine all your thoughts, right? That's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. Um, so final question here is, if you could go back 20-year-old Elliot, what would you, one piece of advice, what would you give him? <laughs> I would just say, hey, it's a fun ride, dude. Just relax. You got this. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. And thanks for taking this time. Do you have anything else uh, you wanted to plug? I'm sure we covered just about everything. Anything else you want to plug before we hop off? Nope. Very cool. Thank you very much, Elliot. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm actually going to shoot you a DM on Instagram because I, I know you're, you're getting into like mantras and affirmations a bit as well. There's someone I, I want to recommend, even if you're interested in having him on your podcast. Uh, his name is Astaris Miraculi. He's, um, he's very much into sound healing as well. So we've even touched on that here. And he has some really powerful affirmations and mantras that I think you're going to be in love with. So I'm, I'm going to send those over to you and get
give, give me your feedback on the ones you do receive them. So I, I think oh, they are. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, and uh, I'll let you know once this is uploaded as well. You got it, Adam. Have a great day. Take care, man. See ya.